Hello, everybody. My name is Juan Carlos Brando. Thank you so much for joining us today. And for me, it's always a pleasure to have one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. Um, today, we're going to be talking about immigration. And of course, everybody can join us and ask your questions live, free. Um, and today, we're talking with the attorney, Robert Ratliff, who is uh, an attorney with a lot of experience. He has been an immigration judge in the past. Now he's working in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates is uh, one of the most important attorneys in the law firm. He goes to court uh, every, I, I would say every day, every week. And the time that he's not in court, he's working really hard trying to take care of all of the cases that he has to handle uh, every single day. So thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget that you can send your questions uh, related to immigration and he will be answering each one of your questions today. So let's welcome the attorney, Robert Ratliff. How are you doing today? Hey, good morning, uh, Juan Carlos. Uh, very good. How's things there? Uh, it's good. It's good here. The weather is getting nice, but the pollen is not, it's not helping. It's uh, making us struggle with the nose, with the throat, eyes. Uh, it's, uh, it's that time of the year. But... Uh, we have to do what we do. That's right. That's right. Get ready yeah, for baseball so, season. Yeah. I will. Um, this year I have the good, um, the fortune that I will be one of the commentators for the Atlanta Braves. I know the Atlanta Braves are one of the uh, rivals of the Cleveland Guardians, but I will be working with one of the uh, former baseball players from the Guardians back then, the Indians, which is Carlos Baerga. Oh, wow. Very good. Uh, he's going to be working with us in the broadcast of the games. So that's a really exciting experience that I will, I will have the obligation to go to the games every week. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. That's tough work. Yeah. Okay. So um, getting into the immigration field, um, one of the questions that people have are what's going to happen with all of these laws that are coming in uh, or that are being proposed in several states like Texas, Florida, uh, Georgia right now is working, the Senate in this state is working uh, to, to create laws that they have called anti-immigrants. So what are your thoughts about this kind of law? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. This is a area that uh, I've worked in uh, and been involved with for a long time. Uh, these kind of laws have come and gone in different states in the past. Uh, Alabama tried something uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, very slim, similar to what Florida tried to do not too long ago. These laws always end up in the federal courts. And the federal courts have been uh, very, um, very firm in the, the holdings that immigration is solely a federal issue. Now, what some of these states try to do is they criminalize or increase the penalties or increase the enforcement for ancillary type activities that they can control. Uh, some of those laws we see are things such as uh, harboring or transporting someone without documentation or proper status, um, employment uh, of, of people without proper documentation or status. Those are types of things that, that can be dealt with at a state level, uh, depending on how the statutes are worded and how they enforce it. Uh, criminal trespass is, is a very common one. Uh, so, so those are the types of things that I would expect to see increased enforcement of. Much of the rest, I expect, will be tied up in federal courts. Um, and how, how powerful are these laws on, or, or what is the outreach of this kind of law? Uh, for example, can a state like, I don't know, Ohio, for example, 
say I want to create a law like the one in Georgia or um, there's a program that I would like to to just copy and paste here. Is that something that they can do? It is. And you see that happening in a lot of different fields where, you know, somebody will create a, a law and it'll just kind of get passed around to the different states. The um, the, the the issue from a, an immigrant's perspective is is what is the impact of some of those laws going to be to me? And while many of the offenses that may be misdemeanors or things at the state level, such as trespass or transporting, could have relatively minor criminal penalties, but may have significant impact down the road with respect to immigration status and availability of relief uh, uh, down the road. Uh, so those, those are very, very, very specific kinds of things that, that people need to be aware of. Um, because th th those little charges add up, you know, it's like we've talked before about driver's license offenses and, and things like that. And those small offenses can, can build up and snowball over time. Well, thank you so much for, um, for talking about this, because this is something that is trending right now in the United States of America, and especially in this year that is an election year. There's a lot going on. Uh, in the political uh, aspect, and so Republicans are uh, are shouting a lot. Uh, the the Demo Democrat Democrat Party are trying to do as much as they can. Uh, something that didn't pass or that has not been uh, discussed yet <clears throat> is the comprehensive reform that was proposed. But we know we know the reasons why. It's not that the government doesn't want to do it, but uh, it has to go to the House and it has to go to the Senate. Um, so, what are the possibilities that this could get to to become reality at some point? Yeah, you know, and it's something that's been a uh, a bit of a political football, if you will, back and forth for for years, and. I don't see a long-term resolution. The, the, the rules change every time there's a new administration, every time there's a new attorney general. So those are things that always become problems. Um, the one thing that both sides do agree to is that the system is, is broken. There are uh, no significant mechanisms to fix it. The, uh, but the, the solutions, that's where we can't find agreement. And it's almost as if the two sides can't, e either side can't let the other side get a victory. So uh, rather than trying to come to any kind of compromise that somebody may see as a victory for one side or the other, they, they, they just take this hands-off approach. It's further complicated by the way our system works and the way our federal court system works, because you'll see administrations make some small changes. Um, DACA off and on has, has been one of those. Um, where uh, um, uh, an administration will implement a policy uh, and then right away the other side or supporters of, of the uh, uh, opponents of that uh, change, that administrative change, go to federal court, they file injunctions, they get injunctive relief, and, uh, and then settlements get created between the Department of Justice and the litigants. And, and now we have policies that are essentially being made by federal court judges um, that impact immigrants all across the country. So those, those are, it's just a complete breakdown in the system, in the, the legal system, in how to best address these cases. People's lives are in jeopardy in, in the meantime, and there's not a real clear way to get your case through court or to get status. That's why every case, you know, you really have to take a look at it from beginning to end see where the case has been, see where the individual has been, and see where they want to go and try to find a path to get them there. It's not easy. Yeah, that's true. And, well, where there is politics, is going to be a lot of issues uh, no matter what. So uh, hopefully the, the next few months or years are going to bring something uh, good for the country, and I'm talking about good for the country, for immigrants, for the people that are born and raised in this country. So we hope to see something good coming in the in the short distance. 
Um, let's start with the questions. And this one says, hello, I applied for asylum and got my work permit. Unfortunately, I got to drink a couple of beers and drove after that. Got pulled over and charged with UUI. I did the alcohol test on the road and got, a, uh, got arrested. How bad is this for my asylum? Well, it's, it's not good. <laughs> uh, it can be very bad. Um, first thing is, you know, the criminal case has to get resolved. That could get resolved in, in a number of different ways. And that's something, you know, based on the court and the jurisdiction where you're at, how that will get handled. From an immigration perspective, when you're in immigration court, there are many times that uh, your case comes down to an issue of discretion. And a judge evaluates many factors. And there are sometimes if the judge finds the factors, he has to grant relief. But many times it comes down to an issue of discretion. And if a judge is looking at 100 people in a day uh, to determine who gets asylum or who gets relief and 99 of them don't have a, a, a DUI and maybe one does, uh, you can see where that may come into play is in that judge's consideration. So that that's one thing to be very aware of. Uh, DUIs. Uh, a single DUI is not always uh, fatal to your case. Um, so, but you just have to be really careful as to how the DUI case progresses through the court, what the results there are. Um, and then uh, you have, you just, you're gonna have to take that into immigration court with you. Um, I, the one thing I will say that you do wanna talk to your attorney about, and as you uh, go into the asylum process, you need to be able to demonstrate to the court that you have uh, accepted responsibility for whatever mistakes were made and are taking steps to ensure it doesn't happen again in the future, such as rehabilitation, participation in alcohol counseling, any of those types of things that may show the court that you're committed to this not happening again. Okay, and this is uh, something that they can do. I've heard that you can refuse to do this test on the road. Is that true? You can refuse to do the test. Uh, refusal is, depending on the state, and in most states, uh, an automatic uh, suspension of any driver's license you may have. Um, it can result in uh, uh, worse penalties if you ultimately get convicted of it in court because judges may take into consideration your acceptance of responsibility in determining what the appropriate sentence is. Um, but every state's a little bit different as to how they apply that law. But yes, generally you can refuse to take the test. Um, doesn't mean you won't get convicted, but um, it may, may make the situation more difficult or easier for you, depending on the specific facts of every case. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney uh, Robert. Don't forget that the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. Um, this next question is, um, who are the people targeted for deportation now? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a excellent question because it changes. That, that, that the people that are targeted changes uh, frequently. Right now, the, the government's focus has been on people with criminal charges. So uh, prior or current criminal charges are probably going to see you on the path to immigration court. The courts, however, have actually been very aggressive, and the DHS attorneys that represent the government in immigration court have been very aggressive in terminating cases uh, under what's called prosecutorial discretion. It's basically a, an offer from the government that you're not a priority. You're not someone we wanna focus on. You've been here, you're not committing crimes, you're, you're just working, taking care of your family. We don't really have an interest in wasting court time on, on those types of people. And so they're willing to dismiss and, and, and close those types of cases. So that's, you know, the opposite of who's being targeted for de deportation, but it shows you who is being targeted. And those are those criminal cases. That's what 
that's what they're really focused on right now. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Robert. Don't forget, he is one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong & Associates, and he has a lot of knowledge. I, I really love talking to you, Attorney Robert, because I learned a lot uh, based on your knowledge, but also the experience that uh, you have had been a judge, an immigration judge, uh, that you see many cases and many good cases, many crazy cases, and many cases that are made up. So what does it mean for a, for a judge um, to, to receive a frivolous application? You know, and, and that's very, very hard to establish sometimes in immigration court. Um, the definition of frivolous in immigration court is not what you would normally think. It, it, when we think frivolous, we think of something that doesn't have any merit or doesn't have any meaning. Um, but in immigration court, frivolous is really focused on whether or not it's truthful. So when you are completing an immigration application, especially asylum, uh, it's, it's false statements that run afoul. If your asylum request is, is denied because the judge finds that, no, you just didn't really suffer any harm or the fact that, uh, you know, you come from a poor area or uh, an economically deprived fa a family and denies your asylum, that's not frivolous. What, what the courts define frivolous as, as is false statements in that application. For example, you go to court and you tell them they, they uh, tortured me because I was gay. But if you're not really gay or if you weren't really tortured, that can result in your application being uh, found frivolous if it's proven that you uh, weren't telling the truth. That impacts everything you do from that point forward in the rest of your time in the United States. A frivolous ruling can render you um, ineligible for any immigration relief in the future. It can uh, uh, have long-term consequences. Be if you are granted relief based on what were uh, untruthful statements, the government can come back and take away that relief that you've had. So people that have been here for years and years may have had green cards or whatever. If the government later finds out that there was a lie, that there was something untruthful, they can move to, to rescind all that. Uh, and then you're in uh, in proceedings fighting for those that relief that you previously uh, obtained. So uh, the, the short story of all that is tell the truth, even if it's not going to maybe work and get you to a winning position in asylum. Getting caught in something that isn't true has significant negative impacts forever. Yeah, and I knew about an attorney that got arrested for doing just the verbatim, the verbatim of asylum applications. It was like a copy and paste, and he had several uh, asylum applications like those ones, and the attorney got arrested for that. So yeah, well, and one of the things that's going on right now, and and I expect that we're going to see a lot more of it in the next year to two years. Um, and even if the if there's a change in administrations, maybe even more is fraud in the U visa system. Now the U visa is a, a visa that people qualify for if they're in the United States, regardless of what their status is, and they have become a victim of crime in the United States. Uh, it started out as you know uh, something that wasn't used very often, uh, and local police have to certify. It's now become very popular, popular so much, in fact, that if granted a U visa, the waiting period is currently around four years before a visa number becomes available. But what we're seeing right now is a number of federal prosecutions where individuals have been charged with uh, conspiracy to manufacture these U visas by creating crimes um, and, and then getting certified uh, from the local police that a crime occurred and then taking that into immigration court. There's a number of federal prosecutions going on right now. Uh, those individuals likely are going to go to prison if they're convicted and face deportation at the end of it. So it's that's a real problem. And, and kind of going back a little bit to who's being targeted for deportation. Yeah, that's good. That's that's a real problem. Those yeah, U visa frauds. 
Well, and that's interesting because uh, because of the people, the rules become tougher. Mm -hmm. Because of people trying to get around the rules or go around the rules, uh, so uh, it's it's what makes it more difficult for the future people that have real cases. Uh, yeah, that's that's very true because the the reaction government is a reactionary body in general, so the reaction to uh, it takes to things like that that are being abused or, or fraudulently obtained is always much more draconian than than what maybe would have happened just in the normal massaging and, and changing of the of the process over time. Yeah, I, I was in the middle of a shooting back in 2018 here in the city of Atlanta. Well, you know, Atlanta is not a very safe city to live. It happens. Um, I was I was in the middle of that shooting. It was outside of a nightclub. I was working in a taxi uh, cab, and some people came out of the nightclub that went to buy uh, to to get their weapons or whatever, and they came back. And then they started shooting the people that were coming out of the of the club. I was in the middle of the fire. I had to get in below my car, mm -hmm. and I asked Miss Wong. If if I would qualify for the U visa, and she said, "Well, there's a lot of proof that you have to find if the attack was against you, if you were harmed somehow, if uh, if you are in videos or something, you have to show evidence that you were right there." So I didn't have that much proof, and I didn't try because um, I I wasn't in the police report, I wasn't in the cameras. I only had the call that I did to the 911, and that's all I did. So I didn't try because I know it's tough. Right. I know it's tough to get. Well, and there's another form of visa in, in situations like that that are uh, for witnesses. And sometimes if the, if the government believes that you are a witness and needs your help in the prosecution of a case, uh, I have a client right now that uh, is in that process. Um, you can uh, acquire one of those witness visas. So, you know, that may be the next step from all the U visa fraud is people stepping forward to testify about the U visa fraud and switching from U visa over to the, uh, to the witness, the S visa. Okay. Mm -hmm. People are creative. Thank yes. you so much for sharing this. Uh, don't forget the phone number to talk to one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong is 216-279-3984, 216 279 3984. Next question is, I am from Haiti. I got my TPS approved 10 years ago, uh, but I have a prior removal order from the court. Can I change this? Yeah, it's very possible. It, uh, and it's something you really just kind of got to look at all the facts and all the circumstances. But an old removal order can be reopened in certain circumstances. The courts have discretion to do that. You just have to show them something and some reason why it needs to be reopened. The, the biggest uh, um, reason why is sometimes changed in circumstances, is changed circumstances. If there is some other form of relief that you may be eligible for, you've been here for 10, if you've been here for at least 10 years now, you may be eligible for some form of cancellation of removal or some other adjustment of status based on family circumstance. Those can all be things that can be presented to the court and, and uh, request to reopen the case can be made. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Robert, for this uh, answer. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Time is important in this country, and this person is asking, Hi, Attorney, I am resident. But I got my purse stolen with my driver's license, green card, money, card. Well, a mess. But I'm trying to get a, co uh, a copy of my green card. I filed I-90, but it's taking very long. Is there a way that I can speed it up? I'm still without license. I can drive or travel because I don't have any ID. I went to the DDS, and they said that they can't help me if I don't show proof of legal status. I am desperate. Yeah, and and that's very common right now. Work authorizations, green cards, all the, all the things that come back from immigration uh, have slowed down dramatically. Um, 
you know, 10 years ago, uh, marriage visa cases were taken 90 days. You get them processed, get the cards, everybody's happy. Now they're taking years. And, and the reason for that is, is many fold. Uh, obviously, the, a lot of the people that work in CIS are, are kind of being moved into other areas due to influx of new people. Uh, one of the things in a situation like this that I always recommend uh, is reaching out to your local congress, congressperson's office. Um, every congressperson has a uh, immigration liaison. Some of them share one or two, but they all have an immigration liaison that directly uh, um, confers with immigration on issues such like this, uh, processing times. Uh, I would recommend taking taking the materials to them, calling their office, getting an appointment with their immigration liaison. They can make calls. And, and when a congressman's office makes a call to immigration, they pick up the phone much faster than if I call or you call or anybody else calls. Um, so that that's one way to speed those up. And that's the if it's been more than about 90 days or so, that, that would be the first thing I would do is call the, call your local congressman's office and ask for some immigration assistance on, on this processing issue. Thank you so much, Attorney Robert. And well, this is a very good answer. And uh, if you need more information, please give us a call. The phone number is 216-279-3984. Don't forget that the office of the Attorney Margaret W. Wong has uh, locations or offices in uh, seven cities of the United States of America, Atlanta, Chicago, Columbus, Cleveland, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina. And the phone number is just one. It's 216-279-3984. You can also visit uh, imwong.com. is the website that you can visit or go to Facebook, Margaret W. Wong and Associates in English. Margaret W. Wong and Associates in Espanol for the Spanish uh, website, also in, in uh, Chinese or Cantonese or Mandarin. Uh, but I don't know uh, how you how you can get there, but I know there is a website and there is a Facebook page that you can go and visit. Also, the YouTube channel, you have all of these videos are uploaded to uh, YouTube and actually we are live right now in our youtube channel um i think we have time for one more question and this person says i came with two kids and my husband to the u.s my husband got deported my kids are 10 and 12. is there any chance of getting documents for my kids i am from bangladesh possibly yes um there are a variety of things to consider in cases like these there is uh, relief available uh, for uh, children that may have been abandoned or separated uh, or victims of abuse from one parent or, or both. Um, and it, whether or not your case may fall within those or something you would want to talk to an attorney about in specific facts. Um, they may also be eligible for asylum and related forms of relief, much like you, you may be as well. Uh, and those are all things to consider and, and review and go over. Uh, other than that, those, those are the kind of the two main uh, pathways right now. Uh, as we've talked about and everybody I think on, on the channel has talked about is the um, that DACA doesn't really exist right now. Um, you can apply, but they're not granting new. Uh, so there is no specific relief uh, just for kids in those situations. The two biggest ones are that special immigrant juvenile status and you really got to look at the facts and see whether or not that may qualify or the possibility of asylum or asylum related types of relief thank you so much attorney robert and well now we have the very last question is going right. to be a quick one what happens if my tv says denied will i be deported what am i protected from when i have a pending tv set T visas are, are very rare, so there uh, usually is a lot of underlying circumstances that uh, um, make those cases very, um, very, you have to work with those very carefully, all right? Um, if the T visa is denied, you would likely be referred into immigration court. In immigration court, you may have other forms of relief. Some of those may be based on what happened that put you in the T visa situation to begin with. 
the U visa that we uh, previously talked about, or uh, types of asylum uh, and, and those types of things. But if you have a, a pending T visa, the first thing to do is make sure that it is that the T visa is as well documented as possible. Um, make sure you've responded to any request for information. Make sure you've gotten all the documents you can and submitted and, and have with that T visa because um, every time in immigration, your first chance is your best chance. Uh, so make sure everything is done as well as possible that first time. Thank you very much, Attorney Robert. And don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984. Our time is up. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate your time and uh, sharing all the knowledge that you have with us in this uh, show, uh, sharing the people, the answers, and answering their questions uh, is very important. And if you don't have uh, an answer for your case and you have visited attorneys or notarios or paralegals, you need to talk to a real attorney in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. Thank you very much, Attorney Robert, and see you next time. Thank you, sir. See you again. Thank you so much. And don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 is the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates, and they are ready to help you out.